All right, we are at the noon hour. I am Dave Scott. Uh, welcome everyone to our BMD webinar, Never Settle When You Settle. Uh, the uh, siren just rang in the background here in Columbus signifying noon. So uh, what we'll do is we'll give everyone another uh, minute or two here to get all logged in, settled in, and then the uh, program proper will commence. So another minute or two and we'll get everything rolling. Got our attendees rolling in. I'll mention this again, but there is a chat function and a Q&A function. So uh, folks will be able to uh, throw comments into the chat, questions into the Q&A. Uh, that way we can uh, make sure that uh, everyone gets their questions addressed and discussion topics discussed. All right, with that, definitely want to be respectful of everyone's time, most particularly our panelists and guests. So I think we'll go ahead and uh, proceed with our programming. I want to welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, I am Dave Scott. I'm the managing partner of the Columbus office of Brennan, Manna, and Diamond. Uh, been a uh, litigator for 25 years. Uh, in the context of litigating, I've uh, learned a thing or two about settlement. I'm uh, very proud to be joined uh, today with uh, Two distinguished uh, panelists. First is my partner, Marlon Primes. Uh, Marlon Primes. Marlon is a distinguished uh, former assistant U.S. attorney for the Northern District of Ohio. Marlon has about 30 years of experience. It's remarkable, Marlon. You started practice at six years old, um, but it's true. Uh, Marlon, uh, since being at the U.S. Attorney's Office, has transitioned uh, to serve as the co-chair of the Brennan, Manna, and Diamond Business and Tort Litigation Practice. Uh, Marlon represents companies across the United States in high-stakes litigation. Uh, Marlon is also a past president of the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association, largest metropolitan bar association in Ohio. Marlon has been recognized for a great number of civic and community accomplishments. Uh, also joining us is Stephen Ifaduba. Uh, Stephen and I go back to uh, law school together uh, not too long ago. Uh, Stephen is corporate and litigation counsel for vice president and corporate and litigation counsel for Washington Prime Group. Uh, he has been for about 14 years. Prior to being at Washington Prime Group, Stephen was in-house and nationwide. Uh, Stephen was also at a uh, large national firm, Baker Hostetler, prior to joining Nationwide. Uh, Steve is very active himself with the Columbus Bar Association, the John Mercer Langston Bar Association. Uh, Steve serves on various community boards, including the board of Kappa, Centero, and Goodwill. Uh, Steve is also quite involved with ICSC, that's the International Council of Shopping Centers. So um, Marlon and Steve bring a tremendous wealth of experience and insights and uh, we're looking forward to hearing their, uh, their thoughts about uh, settlement and compromise. And with that, I will uh, pass the baton to Marlon to, uh, to lead off our programming. Well, thank you so much, uh, David. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be uh, with you and uh, Stephen. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about uh, effective tools for uh, settlement. And uh, I have uh, slides here that should be on the screen here. Uh, one of the uh, challenges with settlement is that it's something that they don't really teach um, very well, I believe in law school. And it's something that's um, you know, not uh, out in the public sphere as much as it should. Uh, what you often see in television uh, in terms of court cases, you see a dispute uh, in the first 15 minutes and then you see a trial uh, 15 minutes into the program or the next episode. And it's not quite like that in reality. And certainly uh, that certainly causes uh, you know, issues in terms of expectations. Uh, settlement is really an important part of the uh, process uh, to be an effective litigator. And one of the things that they don't tell you is that um, the uh, criminal cases take priority uh, in our federal and state systems. 
And uh, as a, a consequence, uh, settlement negotiations are very important to be an effective litigator and effectively represent your clients. Uh, statistics indicate that about 99% of federal civil cases and about 95% of state civil cases uh, settle uh, before trial. And this is before the pandemic and after the pandemic, uh, my best guesstimate is that uh, there's even a greater percentage of cases that uh, settle just because of uh, the, uh, the resources of the court system has been stretched uh, so thin because of the pandemic. Um, before the uh, pandemic, it was uh, pretty much um, standard that uh, it would take um, a year and a year and a half, if not two years for complex civil cases to get through the court system. Um, and uh, as a result of the pandemic, it's even more difficult. They're spinning a, a number of cases off to magistrates and a lot of uh, pressures um, because of the uh, pandemic. So as a result of this uh, dynamic, uh, settlement negotiation skills are more important than ever if you're gonna be successful in representing clients uh, and making sure that their objectives are met. I believe the keys to having a successful uh, settlement are basically threefold. One, you need to understand the case yourself and you need to understand your opposing counsel in order to um, have uh, the best uh, chances of getting an optimum outcome. In terms of uh, the techniques that I think are uh, helpful in terms of settlement, uh, first is uh, knowing your case. Uh, there's really no magic to it. You have to know your case backward and forward. And you get that by having a thorough uh, interview of the witnesses, thorough review of evidence. And one of the things I often uh, point to is that you need to understand how your case fits together. There was a famous show uh, when I was growing up called Columbo. Uh, and he was uh, a detective that had a wrinkle raincoat. Uh, he wasn't well kept. And he really examined facts very, very closely. And one of the things that he did is that he was just about to be done interviewing a key witness. And as he walked out the door, he'd say, and just one more thing. And oftentimes in terms of settlement, it's that one fact that sticks out uh, that can help you uh, settle the case uh, effectively. And the other thing to understand in terms of understanding your case is that um, you need to have a understanding of the elevator speech as it relates to your case, the medium uh, speech in terms of uh, the case, in terms of the length, uh, and then the in-depth story uh, in terms of your, your case to be an effective negotiator. And I kind of, uh, the analogy I use is Bob Rossi, the, the paint guy that I uh, have uh, depicted there. Some of you all may remember. And what settlement it's about is that your testimony is a mosaic and it fits together within the whole case. So you, it's hard to really assess testimony until you kind of look at the entire case as a mosaic. So that's why it's important not only to understand one individual element, but you need to understand multiple elements and how they uh, relate uh, to your case in order for you to be effective. And then also you need to find your Kodak moment. Um, now we're certainly in the television age, now in the computer age. Um, so people are used to seeing visual. So you wanna use visual evidence uh, in your presentation if you have a mediation or through your case, because that can help you. And you wanna use that Kodak moment to develop a theme to effectively tell your story um, to the court, uh, also relaying that to opposing counsel and the client. And that could help you um, in terms of settlement negotiations going down the road. Uh, it's also important to understand to be an effective advocate is to understand the elements of the cause of actions that you're bringing. And you want to do an assessment of that not only in the beginning of the case, but you want to do that an assessment of the elements of the case in the beginning, middle, and uh, toward the end of the case. Because it will help you understand that mosaic that I talked about, what piece is missing, what do you still need to obtain? And so by doing that, you're gonna put yourself in a better position to be able to understand the case. So for example, a tort case, you no know, duty breach, proximate cause and damages, understanding which are the basic elements of a tort, 
understanding how the elements of the case, the witnesses, the evidence fit within those elements or something that you always want to have in front of your mind when you're litigating this case. Same if you're talking about contract cases. Um, you want to understand the elements of the contract and you also want to relay those to the facts of the case as uh, the case moves forward uh, through the court system. Uh, the other thing that's important in terms of mastering the case in order for you to be an effective advocate in terms of settlement is that you really need to divide your case, uh, determining based upon the facts, based upon your review of the evidence, seeing what evidence sticks out, uh, comparing it to the um, elements of the case. You want, to, you want to understand very early on or as early on as possible, is this a, 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 a red flashing light case uh, where... Uh, there's going to be a substantial potential verdict. Is it going to be a yellow case or a green case where you can possibly get a dispositive motion? Um, so those are things that you need to really look on um, very early and continue to examine throughout your case to be effective. The other thing that's very important in terms of the case is that it's important to you know, understand the case and all aspects of the case and your, and your witnesses, but it's very, very important for litigators and also clients to remain flexible throughout the case. And oftentimes we're taught in law school and even us as clients, um, we're told uh, that you need to be linear, uh, A, B, C, D. But in order to be effective in terms of settlement, you also need to remain flexible. And sometimes it's not going to go one, two, three, four. It might go one, seven. And the case that I bring up in terms of um, that flexibility, when I worked at the U.S. Attorney's Office and represented the Postal Service, I had a um, you know very interesting case where um, a postal truck allegedly uh, hit a, uh, a vehicle on the highway. Uh, and the plaintiff was driving the car and she had multiple children in the car and had some pretty substantial damage to her vehicle. So normally, uh, as it relates to a civil case, um, you have fact discovery. Um, and then after fact discovery, you have expert discovery or expert reports and then an expert discovery and then mediation and potentially trial. In that case, when I really looked at the facts and looked at the evidence and really compared it and saw, does everything sound right? Does it look right? Is there anything that sticks out? Is there a Columbo moment? And one of the things that I found out, and I was glad that I was flexible, is that when I looked at the damage to the vehicle, when I looked at the height of the postal vehicle, I said, hey, there's some questions. So I had an expert witness that uh, was very credible, uh, an accident reconstruction expert that I've relied upon on the past. And he actually examined the case. And this was before expert discovery. This was still in the fact discovery uh, phase of my case. I talked to the expert and he says, well, hey, the height of the, uh, the cab of the truck, it's no way it could have done this damage. So even though I had taken the plaintiff's deposition and she had sworn that this vehicle, you know, caused these substantial damages to her vehicle, it hurt her children, um, I was convinced after, you know, going to the site, um, you know, talking to the, uh, the expert witness uh, that um, this couldn't have happened. There's no way that the uh, postal vehicle could, could have been involved. So I remained flexible. And what I did is I called opposing counsel before expert discovery and said, hey, look, you know, um, you know, I don't believe that this happened. I'll let you talk to my expert witness, even though it's not expert discovery. So I was flexible. I wasn't linear. I was flexible. I let the expert speak freely and had questions answered. And as a consequence, um, the next day I get um, a notice of um, a voluntary dismissal of the case. So I wouldn't have, um, gotten that early result for the client and save resources without maintaining that flexibility early on. And that certainly benefited um, uh, the client as well. The other thing that's important in terms of knowing your case is that you have to understand uh, when a case can't settle, when cases are so egregious that a uh, settlement just isn't appropriate. And um, one of the uh, clips that I had, I thought that, uh, we had was a, um, a clip from one of my favorite movies uh, called National Treasure. And as many of you may recall in that uh, particular movie, um, there's a stealing of a uh, uh, precious stock in the Declaration of Independence. And at the end, uh, one of the investigators says, well, hey, somebody has to go to jail for this. Uh, you know, I know you wanna get out, 
uh, but someone has to pay a consequence. So sometimes they're just egregious facts, egregious circumstances uh, that a settlement is just not warranted. Like a national treasure, that's something that couldn't be settled. Someone had to go to jail. And similarly, you're going to have those facts in, uh, in, in cases that you potentially uh, are, are going to handle. And it's good to understand those early, have a thorough understanding of the case and understanding that, hey, this is a case that probably will go the distance, uh, probably needs more discovery, probably need to get to expert discovery. So that's why it's important to really uh, thoroughly uh, analyze your case so that you can understand that facts, uh, uh, egregious facts early on as possible. The next point uh, about being an effective advocate uh, is not only knowing your case, but knowing yourself is very important in order to be effective. Um, and the first point that I would like to bring up in that regard is that when you're developing uh, your style as an attorney, it's like a singer. Everyone has different gifts, but you have to understand what style works for you. And I think lawyers can get into trouble when they're trying to mimic a style that doesn't fit their personality. Like, for example, you have a number of famous singers that are very talented in their own right, but they're not fit for a particular style. So as, as you do these uh, cases, you'll find out what style works best for you. And, you know, my rule of thumb is that it's really important to be yourself because the, the finder of fact, opposing counsel clients are going to know if you're not being authentic and that's going to hurt you in terms of being able to effectively uh, settle the case. Uh, oftentimes you go to courses and they'll say, well, hey, if you have, you know, two lawyers uh, involved in one case, maybe one person should play good cop, ba bad cop. I, I shy away from that because I always assume that people are just as smart uh, as me. So you don't want to play, play those games and lose credibility uh, with uh, the court or opposing counsel or client. So just be yourself. Um, the other thing that's important in terms of knowing you is that it's really important to understand in most instances, honey is better than vinegar. And I wrote an article uh, in a book um, that was um, entitled um, My First Year as a Lawyer. And it was a series of uh, articles from attorneys around the country that relayed an experience they had during their first year of practice. And the reason why honey is better than vinegar is important segue at this point. Uh, is that uh, I had my first deposition prepared pretty vigorously for it, and it was a more experienced counsel. And, and, it, and inevitably, there was a dispute between the parties. I kind of lost my cool, and I was right on the facts and, and citing those facts and citing the law. But after that dispute, uh, the, the deponent, instead of giving you know wide uh, answer that would help uh, in terms of navigating the case, it was one syllable answer. So I won the, the uh, battle, but I lost the war. So it's important to you know, maintain one's, one's cool. And so that's something you need to understand about yourself and understand just about the practice. It's important as well, since so many cases do settle, is to get to know opposing counsel. You, know, you can always find a commonality of interest, uh, whether you went to the same high school from the same town, you root for the uh, the same team, uh, maybe you both like Ohio State, you like the Big Ten, find those commonality of interest because those can be very helpful for you uh, in settling the cases or bringing up settlement discussions um, at an appropriate time in the case if you have that commonality of, of interest and you develop your rapport. The other thing I think is very important in terms of just understanding you and understanding the process, it's really important to extend courtesies to opposing counsel. I don't think that it helps you or helps your client um, if uh, you're just being difficult just to be uh, just to be difficult. Um, a court's going to ordinarily grant extensions uh, and the court expects you know, the parties to be courteous. Um, so it's important that you extend those courtesies because it's going to be more difficult if you argue every fact, if you don't extend any courtesies to breach um, the, uh, the conversation regarding settlement. So it's gonna be easier uh, uh, on you if you extend those courtesies and it's gonna help your client. The other thing you wanna do is you wanna maintain your credibility with the court. It's very, very important because the court has a lot of discretion. So uh, one of the things that I think is very important that you see um, you know, many practitioners is that they argue every point, even points that may not be as favorable to their prospective client. And I would say, avoid that because that's gonna hurt your ability to settle the case. Concede points that need to be conceded and move on. 
The other thing that I think is important in terms of understanding yourself uh, is uh, getting involved in bar associations. Um, if you get a chance to know somebody, work with uh, an opposing counsel outside the practice of law, uh, it's going to make it easier to get extensions, it's going to make it easier um, to resolve cases because you have uh, that history. Uh, it's important also to um, you know, write articles if you can. Uh, and I've had some, some attachments of some articles that I wrote. Um, that's very important um, because it, it's a way of you know, maintaining your credibility, not only with the court, uh, who often reads these bar association articles, but also maintaining credibility uh, with your fellow uh, practitioners. And then finally, as I said before, it's just really important to avoid the gamesmanship um, and uh, you know, be above board to the extent that you possibly can. Uh, the next thing I think is very important in terms of the ability to settle the case uh, is um, understanding your opponent. And one of the important things is understanding uh, your client, reading the room. And that's what I mean by watching the board. And that's a skill uh, that I don't think uh, many lawyers um, kind of hone in on. Uh, it's important to know your case. It's important to know yourself. But you have to be able to read the room. And uh, a case that I'll, I'll bring up is um, uh, in practicing the U.S. Attorney's Office, we practice around the country because we had national jurisdiction with the Department of Justice. You often get attorneys from foreign jurisdictions. So by watching the board, I kind of understood that some attorneys from Richmond, Virginia, I saw them constantly looking at their watches. They had to fly in for hearings. They had to fly in for, um, uh, for mediations, things of that sort. Um, and so I knew that was an issue. Um, so I remember that the, the case got litigated uh, all the way up and through um, discovery. And we had a, um, a settlement conference with one of the uh, magistrate judges in Cleveland. And this particular judge's style is to basically say, hey, I'll hear both sides out and I'll come up with a number and you all can make a decision as to whether you accept that number or reject it, but the settlement's not gonna go through unless both sides approve. So I remember working with co-counsel and saying, hey, look, you know, we're gonna take our time, we're gonna evaluate this. You know, five minutes went by, you know, we did not go back into the room, 10 minutes went by. And so, you know, we thoroughly just wanted to, you know, let the client and uh, let opposing counsel know that, you know, we were gonna be very thorough and time wasn't an issue. And so that they saw that, that we were very well prepared and they didn't have the time and they knew we were going to invest the time that really helped us in terms of resolving that case. So that's something that you want to do. And I wouldn't have been able to take advantage of that had I not watched the board and watched the dynamics uh, between the opposing attorneys uh, and having, uh, you know, conversations with them, you know, while we're waiting for the judge. The other thing is uh, knowing your opponent, you wanna understand who is the decision maker. Sometimes it's not the attorney. Sometimes you can have a situation where it's a runaway client. Uh, and what I mean by a runaway client is someone that's not listening to their attorney. Um, and you can kind of see that by watching the room. So what you wanna do in those situations, you wanna tilt your argument you know, in mediation conferences uh, or conferences with the court. Um, toward the client. So, for example, you might want to indicate um, in, a, in a meeting that, hey, this is going to be very expensive. Um, this is what it's going to take to resolve this case. Uh, emphasize the length of the time. Those are things that you want to focus in on if you have a runaway client. The other thing you want to understand is that sometimes you have unrealistic attorneys. So then you want to focus your conversation uh, during the course of fact discovery and expert discovery on an unrealistic attorney. So there's a ways to kind of pitch your argument to help that person understand that what they're asking is not realistic, is not consistent with other verdicts uh, in this particular jurisdiction. Um, the other thing that's very important in terms of understanding your opponent is really making sure that you understand what the opposing side wants, what the client wants. And one of the, my favorite movies that really illustrates this point is, uh, I think, one of the, the, the best uh, civil uh, litigation movies called A Civil Action with John Travolta. As many of you may recall in that movie, it was about a um, major environmental hazard. And uh, John uh, Travolta is this hotshot attorney that has a national practice, and he represents a family that uh, their water supply is polluted. 
So after a long uh, litigation, he thinks he got uh, what is a very successful resolution of the case. And he cuts a check to one of the plaintiffs. And if you look at the plaintiff's face, he says, well, you know, this is not what I wanted. We wanted the problem fixed. So you really have to understand if you're going to be effective and know your opponent, you're going to have to understand what it is that the opposing counsel wants, what it is opposing point of the opposing a, a party wants. And you can get that by asking questions during discovery, during depositions, um, in, in your paper discovery. And so in that example that I gave in terms of civil action, you want to focus your, your questions, you want to focus uh, your presentation. If that's what they want, cleaning it up, and you really want to settle the case, and you want to have in those keywords that, hey, that's your objective, and how the plaintiffs can get to that objective of making sure the, the water supply is clean. You also want to find the pressure points by understanding your case, understanding your opponent, understanding yourself. And once you get those pressure points, you want to run to that. Also, you want to look at some tools uh, to help you get to yes. And um, I think one of the things that's very important in terms of a tool to help you get to, to yes in terms of resolving a case is really understanding the court. And that's where the Bar Association come in because a lot of times uh, judges uh, are active in Bar Associations. Um, um, not only am I a member of the, um, uh, the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar, which David indicated I was the president of, but I've been active in the ABA, American uh, Bar Association, the National Bar Association. I'm also very active in the American Inns of Court ch chapter. And those chapters are unique in that you'll have you know, attorneys from different practices of law, you have state, federal judges, and so those are just wonderful opportunities. So getting to know them is very helpful. The other thing that's important in terms of getting the yes is the issue of brackets. I really shy away from making an offer if the parties are several million dollars apart because that's really not an efficient use of your time. If somebody's at 10 million and you only have $1 million of authority, uh, you know, putting you know, any money on the table is not in your best interest because if you put $100,000 on the table, and the other side goes down to you know uh, uh, nine million. That's not a real offer. It's not realistic. So brackets can be a way of bringing the sides together. So in that situation, hey, I have one million dollars in authority. Hey, can we agree to a bracket of you know two hundred fifty thousand dollars to one point two million dollars? You know, and so a lot of times opposing counsel thinks the brackets mean the midpoint. And so what you want to do is make clear that it's anything within that range. And that can often be a um, mechanism that you can use um, to uh, get the offer in the ballpark um, so that you're able to settle it. Since these cases are so expensive to litigate and they cost so much money, when the parties get only a few hundred thousand dollars apart, uh, the pressure will be so great um, that oftentimes it, it helps cases settle. So if you're able to get a bracket and you're able to get the parties a few hundred thousand dollars apart, um, that may be something that helps you in terms of resolving the case. Also, you wanna look at soft points. I, I normally don't deal with money first. I deal with the soft points. So when I wanna resolve a case, uh, what I indicate um, is that, hey, um, you know, hey, where do you want the check paid out to? You know, we can get this check for you in six, uh, in six weeks. Um, you know, there's, there's things that you can agree to uh, that are going to build momentum. And, there, and there's like four or five things that you already agreed to. It's harder to walk away than if you just deal with the money up front and you don't deal with the other issues. So I deal with the soft issues and then I walk my way up to the actual number. And that can uh, uh, be an effective tool um, to resolving uh, uh, cases. So um, in conclusion, um, it's, uh, in my opinion, it's very important um, to uh, have uh, the tools uh, to be able to settle cases because so many cases in our um, federal and state system resolve themselves through settlement. And I believe that you can improve your chances for, uh, for settlement uh, by knowing your case, uh, knowing yourself, uh, and, um, uh, and then of course, um, uh, knowing your opponent. So I look forward to any further questions that you may have during the, uh, the course of the uh, remaining portion of the seminar. I look forward to hearing remarks from my uh, fellow panelists, uh, Stephen, and uh, remarks by David. Thanks, Marlon. 
Not sure if you need to uh, pass back control or stop presenting. I think Stephen is unmuted and I think I'm unmuted as well. So that, Mar that was fantastic, Marlon. Uh, my brain was kind of spinning um, at a lot of your points. Um, a couple of the ones that I think uh, are particularly noteworthy, um, which also segue into uh, to Steve, you know, um, you're talking about finding commonality, uh, what you phrased as uh, getting more flies with uh, honey as opposed to vinegar. Um, Picking your fights, so those two concepts, right? Shouldn't the client only want a bulldog? Shouldn't the lawyer only focus on fighting and winning, right? Now, we segue from you, Marlon, to a guy, Stephen Ifaduba, who is both a client and a lawyer, who has been in private practice and right now is in-house. So Steve right now literally is both a client and the lawyer. And I think, Steve, to kind of tee off our dialogue and, and piggybacking on a lot of Marlon's great points, um, what do you think would be some of the biggest differences in perspective or how you go about approaching a conflict when you're a client now as opposed to when you were a lawyer? Um, I think, well, thanks, Dave. I think um, one of the things that I don't won't say struggle with, but when, when I get a conflict or when I get a particular issue in on my desk from a litigation perspective you understand there's been history there with the business folks dealing with the adversary or with uh, the, the business that we have an issue with so they have some personal investment in in, in the case and so um, coming at it from a, a legal per perspective understanding kind of where where our exposure is where where we may have good points and bad points getting the facts getting the predicate facts from um, your your business contact and but at the same time trying to separate out any personal animus any any uh, uh, overreaction any uh, personal perspective outside of you know the facts of the case these guys are just bad guys these guys they they uh, they, they uh, uh, misled us on a previous deal you know months ago unrelated to this and so it can pollute uh kind of what you're dealing with uh in the first instance and with respect to the the, the case the case or the particular issue that you have before you and, and so you want to make sure if i'm dealing with outside counsel in, in terms of assessing whether or not we can resolve this be the case you know and i handle a different matters a collection matter a slip and fall matter a, a contract dispute outside collection make sure they they have a, a good grasp like marlon said of the facts and the situation and don't have as much as sort of the the personal animus that can quite frankly can can prejudice prejudice you or handicap you from being able to effectively resolve a, a case if that answers your question Oh, 100%. In fact, I, I realize I kind of jumped ahead. So a number of uh, the folks who are on the call with us today, um, I'm sure that they may generally be familiar with Washington Prime and exactly what you do. But how would you define what Washington Prime does? And then in the context of what Washington Prime does, what types of conflicts would you say are most prevalent? Washington Prime is a uh, shopping center manager here in Columbus. So we manage Polaris Fashion Place and similar shopping centers around the country. So in my role, uh, I manage our litigation docket for the most part. So that includes uh, collection matters is a large part of our, our, uh, our, our current docket. Slip and fall cases, insured cases where someone allegedly uh, enters our property and, and claims to be injured in some way. Uh, then another bank of cases are sort of uh, lean or material men cases, which I currently have a lot of for, for some odd reason where someone's done some work on the property at a tenant space or perhaps our, our controlled area of the, of the shopping center and, and has it gotten paid. So they're looking to get recovery. And then just general uh, uh, litigation matters, uh, Americans with disability matters, uh, municipal code, municipal regu regulatory matters, um, any kind of fight that can enter, enter, end up before some type of uh, arbitration or tribunal Trier of fact uh, uh, in our judicial system would, would likely come across uh, my desk. And so from a litigation perspective, that's, that's what I deal with. 
So not only do you bring a client's perspective and a lawyer's perspective, but if I understand you right, you're on both the plaintiff side and the defense side. Right. Of so you're both right. and defending. Okay. We pursue our own claims and then also on the slip and fall piece, uh, we're, we're, we, we, we'll be sued a lot. <laughs> or, or the material uh, men's uh, lien cases or the uh, code cases that I talked about, we can't we can be a target for litigation. But all of those are, are, are ample areas in which uh, one can reach a settlement or try and broker a resolution outside of a, a, a judicial process. And that kind of is the that, that's kind of tees up the question, which is, is there anything different when you're considering compromise and settlement? Is there anything different about your mindset um, when you're on the plaintiff side versus on the defense side? So what, what would be some of the commonalities and some of the differences? Well, I think cost always is an issue. Um, you know, how much is it going to cost to take this to resolution? Can we achieve our business objectives uh, with respect to uh, uh, the, the mall in general, a particular space? Um, in, in um, um, either reaching a settlement and realizing most cases end up settling in some way um, um, and, and mitigate and, and then uh, how does that balance against any exposure we have? Generally, uh, from a collection standpoint, uh, you know, a case or account comes across our desk, we're dealing with somebody who hasn't paid any, any, any uh, rent or, or is not operating in some regard, they're not a good tenant, they're not a good, good account, a good credit. So really, they really need, by the time it comes to me, they really need to be out of the mall if they're not out of there already, even if they've, even if they've uh, run up a significant bill, um, they just need to be gone. And so, uh, so that we can relet the space, so we can get the space back and, 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 and start generating uh, positive cash flow from it. Right now, the person's just there and, and, not, and not paying in, in most instances. Uh, so if you can do that effectively without taking it through the collection process, eviction process, and as Marlon mentioned, because of the pandemic all across the nation, the dockets of courts with, with the, as he mentioned, criminal cases being uh, getting favoritism or being, you know, uh, front, front and center, the criminal docket will be addressed first. We don't do any criminal matters, very, very little, uh, all of our civil cases. So uh, the, case, the dockets are behind in the sense that even if, if even if courts are, are at this point, most of them are, but for a time there were no evictions because of the pandemic. So people were in spaces. And so it would, it would behoove you to reach some type of settlement uh, because you could not uh, evict people uh, or it was limited or they, the, 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 there was a, a moratoriums in place for commer even commercial evicting. We know that for uh, residential, but even commercial for a period of time, there was some moratoriums in some cases or in some, in some courts. So at that point, you really, uh, what, what can we, uh, what kind of agreement can we reach to get you out of the space? Cause you obviously can't operate or, uh, the collection staff has, has tried to negotiate a resolution as best they can. Um, and, and now we're at an impasse on the slip and fall side where you have an insurer involved. Um, so it's a, sort of a third party that's involved and has an interest in the claim or, or dispute. Um, and then we have a, a sort of a deductible that we work against that is money out of our pockets. And so we get to that point and then the insurance takes over in their interest. And so do they want to settle the case? What's the exposure? How much is it going to cost? Um, is there going to be some precedent set precedent set with, with resolving it? Um, even though you try and mitigate that as best you can in terms of confidentiality and non-disclosures and disparagement and all that stuff, do, do you want to do you want to settle this? And that could that uh, open the floodgates to other types of uh, claims. And so, and then with on the municipality municipality side, in terms of trying to resolve that, um, um, are, are they open to? Are they just open to to resolve? But sometimes they're they're, they're just strident. And then they want they want their way, and so uh, uh, even if there there is a um, even if even if there's an economic um, sort of hurdle to overcome, sometimes you can't sell it quickly because the other side doesn't want to doesn't want to engage or or is just being very uh, uh, steadfast in their approach. Yep. Ultimately, we can't control people, and we certainly can't control who's on the other side. So yeah, that they're they're the the right. factors that are within. That's right. You need two to tangle. You need two uh, 
uh, reasonable parties, as Marlon in indicated, um, to to reach a resolution. Now, among the interesting things about your perspective, so on 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 our on, on the call, we have participants. We have participants who are clients. We have participants who are lawyers. So the folks who are listening in right now, and. I think they might want to know your unique perspective, having been a lawyer and being a client yourself right now, I guess, and in the context of settlement, what do you like or appreciate most about the lawyers who you use? And mm -hmm. might be some things that you might want to see lawyers do a little bit differently. And then thirdly, how do you go about identifying the right lawyer for your situation? Because like I said, we got folks out there need to hire their own lawyers and could appreciate those insights. And then we have lawyers here who want to know how best they can service their clients. So how do you identify and pick your lawyers? What do you like about the lawyers who do you think do a good job? And what would you like to change um, about lawyers who might want to do some stuff to Well, in the settlement context, uh, trying to find out uh, whether, regardless of the kind of case it is, um, assessing whether or not we got uh, good grounds here to try and settle the cases there. Have they done some legwork early on? either uh, in speaking with the other side's attorney, usually when it gets to me, the attorneys are talking, um, uh, especially in a slip and fall case, you know, we're gonna be talking to the plaintiff or anything like that. Um, on, the, on the collection side, again, setting things up so that um, if it's productive, um, finding out if we can get the business folk, because usually that's what it'll boil down to, some type of business objective or business uh, the confusion or dispute that's at the sort of core of why people aren't, I, we deal in contracts, why people aren't uh, abiding by the terms of the contract. There's some type of uh, biz the business people need to talk in a very productive and um, uh, um, um, environment to resolving the dispute. And so can we arrange things in such a manner? And then on the converse, if it doesn't make sense for people to be talking, just now talk through the lawyers, then kind of assessing that. You know, people are represented by counsel. We, we use this all the time. People are represented by counsel. Uh, you know, the business people shouldn't be just calling up the, uh, our guys and trying to talk things through without making sure the lawyers are involved and doing it in a way in which at that point, you know, conversations are protected and, you know, settlement negotiations are, are protected. Um, can you assessing whether or not it's productive for the business people to speak and having a good sense of that, understanding our business in a way that um, it, it maybe it's such that the wrong people are talking. You have people down the line that are speaking and perhaps some senior managers should be speaking about a particular situation, but maybe it's part of a larger uh, problem between the two uh, constituencies, between the two parties. Um, and, and then some of that's on me. I just have to understand I should be speaking with some, you know, uh, leasing agent who's only been with the company 16 months. He should be speaking, the, the heads of leasing of these entities should be speaking. And then we could get to a resolution or, or accounting or, you know, lease accounting, lease uh, something, someone who understands the crux of the issues and can, and can get to it. Um, that may not be may not necessarily operationally may not be the lawyers the lawyers understand the legal issues but maybe we can get to a re resolution by just hammering out the business issues and understanding that and it would almost seem obvious but different people who might be decisional obviously they're going to bring their different perspectives right and i guess there's a right. art in finding the right person who could facilitate compromise versus some perhaps might not be as ideal for facilitating compromise Right, right, exactly. But both, in, both in, in the context of two companies and their principles, or when you have a situation where we're at, where we filed the lawsuit, the lawsuit's filed, now we're being put into mediation and making sure you have an effective mediator or arbitrator or, or, or whatever, a third party uh, to resolve your, your issues. I've been in mediations with effective mediators. And, and, the, and the case gets settled or not effective mediators. And it's almost like you're pushing, you're pushing the paper across, <laughs> across the table uh, together and nothing, nothing's really happening other than that exercise of, of uh, talking. It's not effective. 
That's where we absolutely are going to loop Marlon back in in about one second to, to chat about um, effective or ineffective third-party neutrals. Before we uh, include Marlon back in, one last thing, I guess, uh, with you would be, you've heard, of course, hawks and doves, right? And you got your earth versus peace pipe. Um, that mindset going into settlement, right? That, that kill the other side mindset versus mm -hmm. just get along. I guess what... Do you, do you have both strategies? Do you choose one or the other? Does it depend on circumstance? I guess, what's your perspective on that scorched earth? No, I, I, I'm, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of in the middle. I mean, you want to be tough. You want the other side to understand your position. It's really, I think, what you're talking about. You, you may do that if you believe someone's not listening to you or they're not comprehending your position or there's not a level of empathy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it boils really down to communication. They understand what the issue is. They understand where they're, we're finding issue with your behavior or your, the way, what you're doing to us. You know, it's, it, it, I think all, the hawks and doves, I think uh, comparison or the, that use of being tough boils down to there has not been effective communication either leading up to or during the, the, the negotiations such that people can't really see where you're coming from. I mean, there are exceptions, you know, to every case, things can be of such a bad sense that <laughs> communication channels uh, probably are such that parties even shouldn't be talking. Maybe you need to get a third party mediator in there to have a, because that's the only way, that's what negotiation is, it's, it's communication and you have to do it effectively. And so if, if you're not doing it effectively and it's such where it's just a bunch of yelling and name calling and, 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 you know, unprof unprofessional uh, behavior going on. It's not effective and it's not going to get you to a resolution of, of the matter. Uh, so that, that's what I find is just making sure that other side understands where we're coming from. We understand and, and vice versa. Uh, we can sort of defend our position. I think that's another thing, you know, just pulling numbers out of the air. Uh, that are based in, you know, your pie in the sky or animus, you have a proposal and it's based in, 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 in fact, or has some substantive, uh, uh, some substance to it. And they can understand, and they can understand it. This is why we want what we want because of, of X, Y, and Z that we believe is, 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 is your issue. And so, as opposed to just some arbitrary number, I would be upset about that too. You know, I've had that. I've been on both sides of it. You know, you just picking numbers out of the air, or, 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 you know, you you mapped out what your damages are. You know, you've done a damages analysis, or the damages are a little bit more uh, ephemeral or more uh, um, uh, uh, subjective. Uh, at least you have some objective uh, bases uh, that someone can understand where you're coming from. And so I think that mitigates being, you know, being hardcore, being striding in your position people just understand where you where you're getting at the truth most often lies somewhere in the middle right in any given right. typically right right i don't know how your experience was or marlin's was when when we began in practice uh some years ago but it was very rare when i was a baby lawyer to hear lawyers especially litigators talking about empathy right and it mm -hmm it may be longer than most to realize the value and the power of understanding where the other side is coming from, understanding their perspective, right. yourself in their shoes and considering that, and then governing yourself accordingly with a better understanding of where the other side is coming from. And that is that that leads to greater communication in my experience. And sometimes if the parties aren't able to do that themselves, that's where a third party neutral can come in. Right. And that's right. what so that's what we're talking about. So for the non-lawyers in our audience, you got a mediator, a third-party neutral. And I'd love to hear from you, Steve, and from you, Marlon, what makes a good or effective third-party neutral and what makes a third-party neutral ineffective? Because if folks are going to take our valuable time and bring our conflicts to someone who tries to resolve them, I guess what makes a good one, what makes, what makes a bad mediator? I, I think the main, I can, I can talk about that if you want me to. Yeah, I, I think the main thing that I look for, and I've, I've mediated hundreds of cases um, um, over 30 years, I think the most important thing is having a mediator that has subject matter expertise in the area. You know, it, 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 the parties will know pretty quickly uh, if the mediator does not have that subject matter uh, expertise. And it, and it makes it more difficult for that, uh, that uh, mediator to be an advocate uh, for any potential, uh, potential resolution. So 
I, I think that's the, the one of the key things. I look at that mediator's background. Have they practiced in that area? If it's a business litigation dispute, have they been involved in business litigation disputes? Have they handled similar matters? Um, the other thing that's important is that, you know, does a person have the reputation for doing their homework? Have they read the relevant pleadings and are they prepared? Because, you know, during a uh, mediation, the uh, sides normally, when we get to that point, have already spent a considerable amount of money. And usually in mediations, you have to bring your client. So nothing's more unnerving, uh, you know, for the clients and also for the attorneys if someone that's mediating a case isn't well prepared. So that's a, a, another thing that I, I look for as well. And then a person having credibility, uh, credibility in the community, um, someone that, that, that has some gravitas so that they're able to go back to a side and say, hey, you know, uh, I've been here before. Um, I understand the facts of the case. Uh, I buy you in such a, uh, a such a way. It's not going to be credible. If they don't have that gravitas, that experience, and I actually pick up the file. Yeah, I second everything uh, Marlon says. And from a client perspective, you really have to rely on your outside counsel for that because we have malls all over the country. I've been practicing here, uh, you know, a number of years, but still, you know, I don't know who necessarily is a good mediator in Seattle or Hawaii or Florida or Connecticut, you know, or Oklahoma. I'm going to have to rely on my guys to identify somebody. Oh, this is a real good guy. Um, and usually the parties have to agree usually on the, on the, who the mediator is or, or, or female um, to conduct the session. And uh, I've done mediations with them in the past with these types of cases and we usually get to a, a conclusion that, that the parties can live with. Um, and, and, and the process is, uh, is fair um, and, 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 and is effective. Uh, something interesting I, I might have mentioned in our prep with COVID, um, and it's changing now, but you know, typically the mediations would be in person. And you know, you're in a conference room and uh, separate them. And um, you go back, they, the media will go back and forth usually. Um, and, and it could be an all day affair and you get to the end of the day and people are checking their watches. So they've been there forever. They have something maybe later in the week or the next day and they can like, uh, okay, let's, let's try and get this resolved. And we've done all this. Whereas COVID, you don't have any of that. You're remote and you might be doing a number of different things. So there's no pressure. There's no time pressure at all. That's gone. Uh, there's no travel. And so it's an opportunity for people sometimes to be more strident, to be more unreasonable, you know, and having a mediator that can kind of break through that and perhaps in this new form in which we're doing things, we probably will continue actually uh, saves on cost. Um, but people can sort of say, Hey, no, no real skin off my back. I don't have a plane to catch. <laughs> um, let me just continue, you know, and that's when you have the empathy, you understand kind of where the other side's coming from. You want to reach a settlement. You understand, yeah, the lawyer may have to do a better job of saying, you know, we got some exposure here. Uh, going to trial has these risks. Um, uh, it, it will not be anything quick. And so they understand the value of mediation, even though it may not seem um, uh, um, a, a, a hardship or something that's hard that they have to do. You understand what I'm saying? And so that they are, are more uh, cooperative in trying to get to a resolution. Uh, if it's something that can be, resolve in an alternative dispute resolution format. The word that, that comes to mind when I hear you and Marlon talking just now is that investment, right? Are, are you and is the other side invested in something? Right? You've gotten on that plane and you've flown to Seattle and you're sitting there in that conference room, you're invested right. now. Right, right, right. But when I log right. off because my dog is in my lap and I'm going to go feed them, when I step into the next room, I mean, that's, that's not as much of an investment anymore. No, there's no, uh, there's no, uh, I don't know, um, I say hardship or just pain in, in essence to, to, to uh, go through, to, to get to a resolution. They don't put, yeah, you know, you're not really invested in, it, it needs to be other variables turned in their head about trying to resolve this particular case the, the, or dispute. Over and above the simple merits of the dispute and all the other levels of analysis you've already done, right? Because you've, mm -hmm. 
paper case and the other right. side of the case. But now when you're sitting there, if you're face to face, it really is. I don't know, Marlon, is it a different dynamic for you that you found post COVID? Well, you know, I, I think that the, the um, remote, you know, obviously is more convenient for the client because sometimes, you know, we'll have, at least in my prior role, we had uh, clients flying out from all over the country. So that is true that there is that extra pressure. Um, but uh, a good mediator, and I think that's just really, you know, important to find a good mediator. They'll find the pressure points and they'll be able to, you know, get the parties to at least consider the risks that they very well may lose or incur, you know, uh, uh, additional expenses. So, I, sure. you know, so I think that, so I think a mediation still can be effective, um, you know, remotely if you have a good mediator. But, you know, oh, I'm not saying it's not effective in yeah. COVID. I'm not saying it's not effective. Yeah. Right. What? Yeah. 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 I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. And uh, I'm not disagreeing with you all. I'm, all I think we're saying is that, you know, there can be additional pressures when you're in person. And I right. guess my point is right. that, you know, you can have those additional pressures, you know, uh, with a good mediator remotely as well. Yeah, that, that's been my experience as well. And we only have a few minutes left uh, for the folks who are in the uh, who are attending. Uh, if they want to throw questions at the chat or the Q and A function, uh, we're happy to do that. What I would say, perhaps uh, maybe a, a final or a couple final questions for the panelists would be: um, I know this is shocking to some, but there are lawyers in the world who are unreasonable. Mm. Um, or, or there are clients in the world who are unreasonable, right? So in your experience, how have you tried to break that log jam? Like what tips or strategies do you guys have when there is an unreasonable lawyer on the other side or, an, or what you, we think is an unreasonable position of the other side? How do, you, how do you break through that wall? Well, the most effective tool that I use is risk. Uh, you have an unreasonable attorney, you know, you basically indicate there's a risk of this going south and there being a, a large verdict. Um, so I think that's one of the things you can do. Uh, the other mechanism that I use is uh, the jury verdicts. Um, Westlaw does a really good job in terms of uh, making jury verdicts um, and then just settlements available. So having a series of jury verdicts to say, hey, your position in similar cases is not supported. I think that's often been an effective mechanism as well. And the other thing I think is important is um, is, is making sure that you're mediating the case at the right time, um, that you have the, the discovery so that you're not wasting each other's time. So if somebody's more difficult, you wanna make sure that you're you know, taking those key depositions, you're weaving in facts, they're gonna let the person know there's a risk of uh, if you're the defense counsel of getting summary judgment or directed verdict, and if you're plaintiff's counsel of a, of a substantial verdict. Yeah, I agree with that. Having a mediation at the right time. A lot of times your me mediations will come on sort of, uh, not the eve of, but uh, in light of some uh, summary judgment that's been filed. Mm -hmm. Or you're waiting on the ruling for that. Or a motion to dismiss or some dispositive motion that that that, that encapsulates and sort of um, uh, crystallizes that, that risk for the other side. Timing, you know, again, it's going to be four years man, before you get any type of judgment. <laughs> then we have appeal rights or you can have this pot of money now. <laughs> you know, I mean, sometimes that, that really is uh, uh, crystallizes something for another side um, or, or, you know, letting them out of an obligation. You know, you can walk, we get the space back um, or we can go to trial and we'll get attorney's fees or something, uh, put a lien on your house or the, things like that. Or, um, um, from the collection world. Um, and I did want to mention, sometimes uh, Marlon pointed out, sometimes you have cases that just can't be settled. Um, and sometimes it has to do with the issue or the other side. You know, I had a, a ADA issue against a public interest group for one of our properties. And that's just not going to be settled by any amount of money. They're going to, they want, you know, they're, they're true believers and they want uh, uh, what they want. And if we can't get to an agreement about the issue, about resolving, it, even if we think we, we're in the right, we're, it, doesn't, it doesn't apply to us. All the uh, exceptions to the ADA apply as it related to this particular uh, uh, matter. Um, and we can't resolve it uh, amicably, then we got to litigate it. And that's just one of those things. Like, again, I, I had trouble convincing my internal folks, can we just pay them some money? But no, I mean, back, even if it's a billion dollars, they're going to say, 
well, why don't you just <laughs> fix the property? You're saying it's too cost too much. Why are you paying us? Just as an example of how that, you know, that just doesn't work in, in this instance. You're going to have to either figure out, uh, come to some resolution regarding the issue with them or fight it out. You know? And then it's them understanding what that takes. Depositions on our side, depositions on their side, you know, in that process. Almost never is it terribly easy to resolve a conflict once it's come to the lawyer level, right? It's very difficult. It's very rare yeah. case that goes away easy. And I find that the, the, the most effective way, and this is kind of points that, that you and Marlon have made, and I'll, I'll just wrap up because we're just about done here, which is I find the only way that you ever maximize your ability to settle is if the other side knows that you're willing to fight. Sometimes you have to put the stake in the ground. You got to get your case ready. Mm -hmm. Point of knowing your case and your point, Steve, timing and everything is sometimes ultimately you just got to fight, right? Right, but right. The smart just people so are like you guys who always exhaust compromise before they go there. So with right. that, we're at 101. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you guys' time and insights. This is Thank great. Thank you. I'm sure the audience uh, appreciated everything, but uh, we will let everyone go. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. All right. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank have you. Have a good day. My pleasure. Right, bye. Thank you. Bye.